Um, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking today's other presenters. Um, I, I was worried that I'd be talking to a room full of eyelids uh, by this time, um, but I've had some fascinating and engaging uh, talks, given me some real food for thought in terms of um, the, the carbon footprint of our renewal programme, for one, um, how we continue to, to develop our staff, develop ourselves, um, and how we stay relevant as an industry in, in pretty chat challenging times. So um, hey, the DHS1 asset and, and network rail high speed are a really interesting point in our life cycle. We've been operating for nearly 20 years um, and we're starting to see deterioration in those assets, um, driving demand for, for renewal and refurbishment. So what I'd like to talk about today is my own personal journey as part of a bigger, bigger transformation programme going on in the business. Um, so with that in mind, I'll make no apologies for the fact that it's very heavily track focused um, and, and probably a little lighter than some would like on detail. Others have got trains to catch and won't mind that at all. Um, I'd like to describe how we've used a well-designed asset and controlled conditions to develop a robust approach to maintaining infrastructure performance um, as we set about delivering our renewal plans. So for those that are uh, unfamiliar, this is a very, very quick overview of the HS1 route. Uh, it's been described as a few things in the time that I've been around. Um, a 60-odd mile siding was, was probably one of the least complimentary. Um, and uh, a last remnant of the Norman invasion. Um, but, but what we are is, is, for now at least, the UK's only high-speed operator and um, 110 kilometre connect... connect uh, connection from uh, St Pancras down to the interface with Eurotunnel uh, at Folkestone and then through to, to Lille and Paris. The route's categorised in three sections really, so we, we've got what's effectively a London terminal at St Pancras, uh, looks very similar to what you'd see at, at Euston or a remodelled London Bridge, um, lots of, of concrete RT60 S&C, compromised geometry, uh, very low speed. As we come out of there into section two, uh, speeds go up to 230 kilometres an hour. We, we've got three very long slab track tunnels, single bore tunnels, um, that are, are between three and 10 kilometres long. Um, and then we come on to the, the truly high speed ballasted section once we get south of the Thames, with speeds going up to 300 kilometres per hour. Um, the route's character, characterised by having to fit around the, the Kent countryside and, and geographical constraints. So we've got a combination of steep vertical gradients, um, high cant and high deficiency curves, uh, and lots of structure interfaces and transitions. We run a mixture of domestic and international passenger services um, with, with very, very different ride characteristics. And we also are a, a freight route. So we're, we run freight with speeds authorised up to 140 kilometres an hour and 22 and a half ton axle loads. Our role as network rail high speed is to inspect, maintain and renew the infrastructure as a contractor to HS1 Limited, uh, who have a 30 year concession to uh, own and operate the infrastructure. So our challenge, um, we're... Um, a little more, uh, or able to think a little more long term um, than certainly than I was used to in a maintenance world. So, so having the stability of that concession agreement um, means that we can we can plan ahead, um, and, and also that our, our renewal cost uh, is directly linked to. Oh, sorry, the access charges are directly linked to to renewal costs. So, um, where we can justify that spend. Um, to, to deliver an agreed level of quality and performance, um, that, that's offset uh, by effectively what, what, what's charged to passengers. So um, it, it's really important that, that what we deliver um, provides a, a service that's affordable um, while remaining reliable and convenient for, for passengers. Um, so there's, there's clearly some conflicting challenges in there. 
um, which means we, we're now needing to provide a robust um, submission for what we want to do going into what will be control period four um, to make sure that we can fund and deliver uh, a plan that gives our client, um, our customers and our regulator confidence that we can deliver the right things at the right time to, to maintain those levels. Um, we also need to consider the longer term implications of that. So while the concession may only last for 30 years, the infrastructure is not going to disappear. So we, we need to consider the long term implications of what we're doing and look at 40 years and beyond. Um, we, we've also got uh, a challenge in asset life. So everything was commissioned on the same day. Everything's taken the same tonnage. Speeds are similar. How do we differentiate those assets? How do we prioritise? Um, and, and how do we spread that, that demand such that it can be delivered by the supply chain um, in a, in a cost-effective and an appealing way? But also that we replace the, the last thing before it reaches that drop-off point at end of life um, uh, and we see that deterioration in quality. So that, that really is our, our conflict to maintain that level of performance while also delivering high availability um, and, and basically minimising our footprint. So, so how do we model the, uh, the right access opportunities to, to do this in, a, in a, an efficient way? Um, so not an unreasonable set of requests, but, but something that's going to take a lot of thought to, to deliver. Done. So, um, what, why, why did we need to do something differently? Uh, as I mentioned, we're midway through control pe period three. This was the first control period in which we delivered track renewals. Um, so it's been a, a really good uh, opportunity to take stock of our, our progress so far um, and, and to look at what we could do better moving into the next submission. We've had some real successes in, in CP3. So um, we've, we've developed uh, some real expertise in changing swing nose crossings, building on best practice from, uh, from other infrastructures um, uh, and creating our, our own methodologies, our, our own supply chains for doing so. Um, we've, we've also uh, changed a lot of um, our T60 S&C at St Pancras and got really slick at doing that in um, the, the non-disruptive, the white period access windows so that we're not affecting, affecting passengers and taking away that opportunity for our, our operators. We've also delivered re-railing um, relatively well uh, and, and are continuing to build efficiencies there and, and overcome some of the constraints around delivering it in high speed areas such as not being able to leave scrap materials line side uh, which is a a, a bit of a crutch um, uh, in the rest of the network. Um, hopefully soon we'll, we'll deliver ballast refurbishment as well. So what, while that's maintained a high level of, of asset performance, um, we certainly acknowledge that we could do better in terms of uh, the cost, cost of work done, our unit rates, uh, and, and in the um, access windows that we do it in minimising that, that footprint. So um, we, we started by going back and looking at the, the journey we went on to create that CP3 plan, uh, which was looking at a mixture of manufacturer recommendations and industry best practice. Excuse me. So th this gave us a design life in, in years. Um, as you know, track, track doesn't really degrade over time, it degrades over traffic. Um, so we found that when we went and looked at an asset that was 20 years old and had a 20 year design life, it didn't have 20 years of wear, surprise. Um, so we, we started looking at, at how we could better um, predict the deterioration rates as a function of what we were actually doing. So um, we looked to, to industry best practice and models such as VTISM. Um, but because of the, the contrasts in the way that we'd preventatively maintain the asset, 
um, and the baits in benefits of, of good construction, these didn't necessarily align well. Um, we also saw that the other high speed infrastructure operators had, had similar challenges. Um, high speed rail was a relatively immature um, asset class. Uh, the oldest lines are around 40 years old, so there's, there's not that evidence of having gone through multiple deterioration cycles um, or of people sweating the asset to the point that you find out what happens at end of life. Um, so uh, we, we found that the, there wasn't something there that we could take off the shelf and apply. Um, to add further complexity, of course, most of the high-speed operators uh, use a, a single category um, of trains, even, even though uh, SNCF, for example, still operate uh, Talis, Eurostar and, and others. Generally, they're high-speed trains with similar ride characteristics where we're operating a very, very broad range of, of traffic. Um, that combined with our geometric constraints makes us quite unique um, and relatively small. Uh, so we've tried to use that size to our advantage um, and use it to uh, basically take a, take a bespoke approach. So I'd just like to, to describe a little bit about the um, modeling that we've, we've done with track uh, and, and how, we, um, how we're trying to to um, come up with those asset life predictions. So what, what I've always known is that we've got a wealth of information that, that we in no way fully utilize. So we go out there, we inspect, we measure, we collect data, um, we put it all on a, a hard drive somewhere or a server um, and, and kind of don't use it. So, uh, I, 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 I was really keen that we brought all of that together to um, give us the big picture uh, and, and to tell us how the asset's performing um, and, and which of those factors would be the biggest contributors to, um, to the, the asset deterioration and the drivers for renewal. So with, with HS1's support, we engaged PA Consulting and, and Mott McDonald to work with us on building a, a track deterioration model um, bringing all of those data sets into one place to uh, give us a, a prediction of our asset life across the, the whole network. Um, so the first thing that, that we had to do in, in building that was to identify the, the key influences on deterioration um, and, and what data sets we could use to represent them. So um, these might all sound fairly obvious, but the, the design geometry, what, what have we actually got out there? We, we got really, really detailed records from construction, um, so we're quite easily able to pull all of that together. The track environment, is it in a long tunnel? Um, is it a, a structured transition? Um, is it overbridge, underbridge, earthwork, um, ballast or slab? We know all of that, we, we can pull it all straight over. The track quality information, so we, we run the track recording coach every six weeks, so we've got sample data points going back 20 years um, for, for both our long wave ride quality um, and short wave defects, localised geometry issues. Rail condition, um, probably one of the biggest data sets that, that, that anybody has um, and, and probably one of the more predictable things, certainly over a, over a long distance. So um, our head and side wear, RCF, rail defect history, um, rail defects in particular give rise to a lot of geometry faults on high speed lines that then become our drivers for ballast deterioration. Um, we then looked at how maintenance impacts the deterioration rates. So when we tamp and we grind, we're doing that to maintain a level of, of performance and behaviour but in doing so, we have artificially taken some life out of the asset. Um, once we got all of that together, um, we went through a big data conditioning exercise. So getting it all into a consistent format such that it could be absorbed um, and understood by, by machine learning um, algorithms and, and by, by tools that allowed us to display that in a, in a usable format. Um, and then basically overlaid that with the, the trains that we've run. So um, had an excellent data set for the, the traffic that had operated across the network. 
basically knowing every train that, that has run since construction. So um, it, it was really powerful in, in being able to equate that to a, to a tonnage that, that passed over the network on a, a yearly basis and then, then overlay that against the deterioration rates in the assets. Um, once we got all of that into one place and could start drawing some conclusions, we were able to assign weightings to, to those behaviours um, and, and to come up with um, our, our key influences on deterioration. We also did that in such a way that we could go back and add further data sets, um, having acknowledged some fairly large gaps that I'll, I'll talk about shortly uh, in, in, our, um, in our asset data. We designed it, everything in such a way that all of the assumptions and all of the relationships that we've applied now can, can be changed um, and, and any sort of coefficients. So as our knowledge evolves, as we track this over time and, and see whether that real world behavior aligns with the model, if it doesn't, we can correct, we, we can improve, we continue to, to, to um, refine our approach. So once we got, um, got to the point of understanding the asset behaviour, we then needed to turn that into something that was um, deliverable and that we could articulate as a renewal plan. So um, we, we used those tonnage-based predictions of asset life to then go back to where we started and say, right, well, based on our, our anticipated traffic volume, that means we'll need to change this asset in, in X year. Um, effectively giving us an engineering target year um, based on the traffic that we expect to run um, in, in various different scenarios. Uh, unsurprisingly, this was quite, quite spiky and we got some pretty uh, significant variations in asset life. What they were generally down to was, was localised issues with the infrastructure. Um, so where, where we've got a localised problem, we, we can't let that drive wholesale replacement of the asset. Um, and, and effectively, we, we took out those spikes and that they'll become the foundation of, of our refurbishment programme. So we need to go away, we need to do the root cause analysis, understand what's driving those and take a more surgical um, intervention such that we minimise the amount of, of heavy renewal um, at high cost, high material usage um, and high disruption that, that we have to undertake. Once we got to something that, that looked a little more um, aligned um, and, and efficient, uh, we, we looked at the, the best way to deliver this. So where can we use a production line approach? Um, when we're doing something like ballast cleaning, we, we took a lot, of, a lot of best practice from um, high output to, to where we, where we minimise repetition, where we use the equipment in the way that it's happiest, um, e even to how you tailor your, your return forecast to, to deliver the, um, the best productivity. Um, we, we looked at how we optimised uh, asset life and production efficiency. So, so while we could potentially have sweated things for a few more years, what, what's the key driver? Um, so if, you're, if you need to go and change your sleepers, but your rails aren't due for another 10 years, you're not gonna go and change the sleepers and then go back and change the rails, do it all together. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, getting that, um, that flight path, uh, glide path uh, correct, such that we get to the last thing um, at, at the optimal time. It does mean that you've got to start your interventions at an earlier point, um, but, but still doing that as, as late as possible. Um, so th that then gave us a chance to adopt our maintenance approach, or adapt our maintenance approach as well. So um, if you know you're not going to fully utilise the asset life, does that give us an opportunity to uh, maintain slightly less intensively um, to, to still achieve the same, the same asset life without the degradation in performance? 
I'd like to talk a little bit about delivery integration, um, and I probably should have asked somebody to, uh, to give me a bit more of a textbook definition for this one, um, so you get mine, um, which is that we look at the big picture, um, and surprise, surprise, that big picture is a little bit fuzzy, uh, to see how we get the most from our resources uh, in the least disruptive way. So first things first, there's an overall question of how do we get at the railway? Um, what, what do our operators and our customers need? When can we really not have access to the track? And, and when does it just not really suit them? Uh, how do we strike that compromise in getting decent engineering hours um, w without uh, upsetting our passengers? Um, and, and where's the seasonality in that? You know, it's particularly with um, a leisure operator like Eurostar, there's, there's certain times of the year when it's absolutely critical that they're able to run trains every day um, and, and we need to work with them to achieve that. Um, do we need one line or both? Um, simple in our world because it's, it's predominantly a two-line railway but can, can we leave a line open and still run a reduced service while, while we're doing um, engineering work on the adjacent one um, benefiting from a from a massive uh, six foot uh, it, it's probably a little easier than in other areas to do that with with speed restrictions in place how long do we need to close the railway for um, and, and when we open up post work, what, what restrictions do we need in place? Do we need a speed on um, for a period of time? And, and does opening at reduced speed sooner offset the additional time that we'd need to, um, to hand back at line speed? Do we need prep and follow up shifts to, to minimise the, the duration of that core work? And what do they entail? Can, can we fit those into, into the white periods? Have we got the right number of people to efficiently set this up um, for possessions and isolations? It was a real real piece of good practice that I've, I've taken away from my time on Thameslink. So we had dedicated possession support um, that, that made sure that we squeezed every minute out of our, our maintenance and renewal teams when we got access to the railway. Once we've got those possessions secured, how, how do we actually get things onto the railway? Um, so, how do we get material to site? What can we bring out by rail? Where we can't bring it by rail, which always seems like it should be the, the preferred option, um, where our road rail access is, what, what plant do we need to, to get onto the track? Um, and, and then once we've, uh, once we've got all of that sorted out, what about our line side neighbours? Who are, who are we going to annoy by doing all of this, this work? Um, and how do we massage that relationship um, to, to minimise our, our footprint um, and extending that to the little furry and slimy ones as well. We, we, we shouldn't disturb our natural environment by doing this work um, and should always be conscious of our, our environmental impact. We then finally get round to talking about renewing the track. Um, but when we do so, what about our colleagues in, in signalling and, and so in HS1 terms, OCS, uh, overhead catenary systems? Um, what equipment do they have that needs to be removed and reinstated to, to deliver track renewals? Will, it, will what we do affect the position of the track? Um, in, in a lot of cases, the answer is going to be yes. If so, does that, that contact wire need to move um, to, to match the new track position um, and where it does, what, where does that fit into the critical path and what equipment is needed to do so? Do we need an isolation um, where we can work without? It's going to give us a lot better, lot better possession time. So um, if we can do that safely, then why wouldn't we? Do any of the things we've taken off need replacing with new ones? It's a, an excellent opportunity for efficiency. Um, and now that those teams are there, what, what can they do to, um, can, can they deliver any renewals in their own asset categories while the core track work's going on? So if you need your signalling team to disconnect and reconnect at either end, essentially gives them six, eight hours of working time in the middle to um, do something more constructive. 
there's also a whole array of civil assets that sit alongside where, where we have other, other potential opportunities. So looking towards the future, um, we know that nothing lasts forever. So um, what, what do we do to, to keep, keep this momentum going? Um, and, and how do we predict the things that currently are, are so far in the future that we don't really know how they're going to degrade? Um, for example, our slab track we could potentially be looking at 100-year asset life. Um, what, what measures can we put in place now to, to effectively track and monitor that such that when, when that, that really, really disruptive renewal comes around, we know what we need to do and we can give people plenty of notice and build the right tools to do it. We've acknowledged that, that sleepers and ballast are, are data sets that we can make huge improvements to. So what can we put in place now to, to monitor that? Um, what can we do through automation to improve data quality, uh, particularly with elect electronic data capture and the systems that we place that in? Um, and, and one of the big ones for me is our people. So we, we've got trains running around, we've got people walking around that capture a, a whole, whole array of data through, through touch and through vision. How do we translate that into useful insights into the infrastructure? So to, to finish, um, it's, been, it's been a very long day. I will keep this very brief. Um, thank you for indulging me. Um, ha having listened to that, you're probably thinking, is, it, is there anything useful here? Um, what, what can I take away? Um, I, hopefully there's, there's a couple of things. So to, to very quickly summarise, um, reverse, reverse engineering 20 years of asset knowledge was really hard. So, so building good systems to capture that data in real time and translate it into a usable format um, pays massive dividends further down the line. Um, no, knowing what traffic you'd run and where was, was hugely powerful. Um, customers and stakeholders having skin in the game, um, really helpful when it comes to negotiating access, finding better ways of doing things. Um, and, and understanding their requirements and what drives their behaviours um, helps you to go back with the right solutions and the right kind of proposals that aren't always the most obvious. Um, we're seeing real benefits from, from implementing a preventative maintenance regime um, in terms of extending asset life, but we also shouldn't be afraid to, to challenge the standards, challenge the processes, look at where we can deliver efficiencies um, or where we need to make a strategic intervention to stretch asset life. Um, and consider the big picture. So when we look outside of our own silos, we can see, see efficiencies um, where it involves a bit of compromise on our, our own ideal solutions. Um, and the very last one is, is to always be self-critical. So even when things are going well, to, to always be asking what, what could we do better? Um, thank you very much for your time and I'll hand back to Liam.